you today. Please join us for the second part of this message. Blessings are intentional. Blessings are intentional. Don't just talk about it, be about it. As I spoke to Don't just talk about it, be about it. Praise God, praise God, to God be the glory for the great things he has done. I welcome you now to another broadcast here at Shiloh. We are a church that loves to praise God and send up praises unto his name. As a matter of fact, if you would just join me, lift your hands in the air. I get, I get joy out of just lifting my hands and worshiping God. Thank you, Father. Thank you, thank you. Sometimes you have to exhale. We adore you, Lord. We magnify you. We glorify you. Oh, don't get me started because praise and worship was so good. We're going right into the word of God this morning. Again, uh, chat somebody, hit somebody up, let them know we're on. But there's a message that God wants me to get in your spirit. Go with me to the book of James, the epistle of James, chapter 1. Thank you, musicians. Amen, amen. I can just sit there and listen to the word. James chapter 1, the epistle, the letter of James chapter 1. If you're there today, I'm going to begin reading at verse 9. All right, I'm going to pick up at verse 9 of the first chapter of the epistle to James. I'm reading an NIV version. So, you know, you calculate that with your version that you have. Believers in humble circumstances ought to take pride in their high position. But the rich should take pride in their humiliation, since they will pass away like a wild flower. For the sun rises with scorching heat and withers the plant, Its blossoms fall, and its beauty is destroyed. In the same way, the rich shall fade away, even while they go about their business. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial, because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. When when tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away, watch this, by their own evil desires and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. Sin, when it's full grown, gives birth to death. Don't be deceived, my dear brothers. And sisters, every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father above, the Father of heavenly lights, who has no changing or shifting like shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth, that we might be the kind of first fruits of all he created. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry, because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and evil that is so prevalent, and humbly accept the word planted in you which can save your soul. Do not merely listen to the word and deceive yourself, but do what the Word says. For as long as the Spirit of the Lord will allow, I'm going to speak from this thought. Blessings are intentional. Those of you who are joining know that we are picking up in part two of this revelatory teaching that blessings are intentional. Don't just talk about it. Be about it. Blessings are intentional. Don't just talk about it. Be about it. The Shawshank Redemption is a movie, a classic, that has garnished a lot of awards because of the nature of the inspiration it provided from its theme. What was the movie about? It was about 
Andy Dufresne, paid, played by Tim Robbins. He was a banker who unfortunately walked in, caught his wife and her lover in bed, and supposedly murdered them both. Now, we know from the beginning, if we were watching the movie, he didn't do it. He was not guilty. He was innocent. But he was sentenced to two life sentences for murder in the Shawshank State Penitentiary. Now, the movie goes on to show us, here was this banker trying to adjust, had never done anything criminal in his life, trying to adjust to prison life. So you can imagine, when he first got in prison, he was sexually assaulted. Uh, not only was that, he was picked on by the guards because he didn't understand prison life. You thought, looking at this movie, Andy Dufresne was not going to make it. But later he got, on, not only did he make it, he became some sort of uh, almost a cult figure in the prison. Why? He befriended, uh, the person he befriended in the movie was Morgan Freeman's character, Red, I mean, Ellis Red Reddings, who was a contraband smuggler. That's the part that Morgan Freeman played. And Morgan Freeman taught him the ropes about prison. He didn't just learn the ropes. He knew now how he could make it. He started using his skills. He was a banker. Pretty soon he started doing the uh, tax returns for the guards. He started, uh, the warden had a illegal business on the side and needed someone to juggle the books to do or, or to launder the money, and Andy was selected to do that. And not only did he do that, he had a library put in prison. He gave some of the convicts who were with him, some of his fellow inmates, he got them GED. So pretty soon, people were going to him for advice. Well, a prisoner came along who knew that Andy was innocent. He was transferred into the prison to say, I heard about your case. I did time with a man who is the real killer. Andy ran to the warden and said, warden, you got to help me. You got to help me. You can get me out. The, the, matter of fact, this guy said he has evidence. And the warden said, no. Andy said, what, what, what do you mean no with all I've done for you? And he said, and warden didn't say this, but he didn't want to lose his golden goose. He didn't want to lose somebody making all that money. As a matter of fact, he had the young man killed who was the witness. He threw Andy in solitary confinement. Here is where the redemption came in, the title of the movie. Andy then made up his mind that he was going to break out of prison. He had taken over his life. He made up his mind he was going to break out of prison. What he did was this thing we put together. And you got to watch the movie to see how ingenious it was what he did. But finally, he not only got out, he created another whole character, a fictitious character. He invented a person, put did two sets of books. So the warden thought he was keeping his money, and he put two sets of books together, turned his way out of prison, and lived with the money happily ever after. But that's not the part I need you to see. But you, need to, you do need to see the movie. It's a great movie. But the part I need you to see is this movie, the the aspect of the movie that really took the movie uh, that really took the movie going audiences by storm was the number was it's 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 deep sociological look into desperation despair and adapting when life gets so bad that you have to change up and out of that came a lot of quotes uh, a lot of quotes from the movie that talked about real life and the one that we're using in this introduction is when Andy found out about life, either you are going to conquer or you're going to be conquered. And he said this, and I want to offer this to you as we open up the second part of his message. Here's what he said. It's, it may not seem deep at first, but listen to it. He said, get busy living or get busy dying. Oh, I hope you saw it. Get busy living or get busy dying. What he's saying is either... You're busy living, you're busy personally, intentionally trying to get on with your life, or you're busy dying. The alternative is not there. When you stop, you're actually dying. And there's many, many saints out there, we're talking about blessings being intentional. You're sitting out there stuck, and you don't realize until you get busy going from where you are and start living above where you are and start moving towards your destiny, you're really moving toward death. What I want to shake somebody up and tell them, you're not just listening to a message. If you you're sitting out there hopeless or defeated, knowing that you got God and all that God has for you, able at your disposal, and yet you sit there in despair. You're not living. You're really dying. And the reality is when you start dying, you miss what God 
has for you. Blessings are intentional. This is not just uh, a movie. It's in the Bible. If I were to give you, uh, if you were to remember uh, 2 Kings chapter 7, verse 3, picks up this theme about if I'm not living, I'm really dying. Oh, somebody out there, I hope you caught that. You're looking at me, but you could be living, but you, you're dying when you're not moving toward your destiny no matter what. The outside circumstances. In 2 Kings chapter 7, verse 3, you remember when the kingdom of Samaria was surrounded by the uh, Syrians and nobody could go in and nobody could go out. And there's this uh, very well-known scripture. It said in verse 3, at the entrance of the gate, there were four leprous men. They sat there and then they said, why sit here until we die. Same thing Andy's saying. Why just sit here in this condition, say we got leprosy, the situation's bad, and but we might as well move on and try to find something to do. What I'm telling you is you can't keep bumping into blessings. you got to know that blessings are intentional. Andy was right. Those three, those three leprous men were right. They kept on going, and they found something that they would not have found if they were stuck there. God brought me here with a message. I'm getting ready to tell you about one of the most revelatory, one of the most prevalent principles in scripture that can save your life and that is if you're going to get out of your situation you have to be intentional blessings just ain't going to knock you over blessings are not going to bump into you some of you have been living off the fumes of god's grace and god's mercy when god said i have all of heaven at your disposal you just gotta want it and intentionally go after it what am i talking about if you understand this text matter of fact uh saint augustine said it best there's, there's a phrase St. Augustine said, um, if you, now listen, now watch this, if you want to get a change in your life, pray like everything depends on God, but work like everything depends on you. You have to work. There's too many Christians out there, you're looking for a blessing. But not doing anything about it. You're crying for a best friend. Oh, I'm hurting so bad. I know God's going to come after me. Or you're just sitting around hoping for a blessing. But that won't get it. You're doing everything but working toward a blessing. There is a principle out there. There is a scripture in the word of God that God said, I made so you can get through this. Here is the understanding of why blessings are intentional and what God meant by that. Here it is. Don't miss this. God is an intentional God. He pays attention. I'll say it again. God is an intentional God. God pays attention to every detail. He's laid out every fact, every cry, every moan, every bad day in your life. God sat in heaven painting a masterpiece of your life, saying, I put a scripture in my words that they are supposed to grab a hold of because I've set their life up with the circumstances that will run them right into my word. And whatever they need, the word is full of an anointing that can deliver you. But you can't sit there. You got to take the word and you got to work with what the word said to do. What am I talking about? Listen to me. In this text, in the first chapter, verse 22, which is where we're going in the text, there is actually something that shows the culmination of the Word of God, that shows what the reality is of our discipleship, uh, what the end of our discipleship is, how we're supposed to act. If you can do this one verse, you will then have conquered a lot of major scripture. And it's the sub-point to the text we have today. It says, blessings are intentional, but then James said in verse 22, don't just be a hearer of the word, be a doer of the word. Don't just listen to the word, grab the word and do the word. There's a lot of us listening but not doing. God expects you to grab the word and work with it and move forward. The reality is when you're just a hearer and not a doer, you're doing a lot of talking but you're not doing any holy living. You got to grab that scripture and it's not easy. And you got to make up your mind. I'm going to move forward into everything God has. I can direct my spirit, direct my life into the blessing God has for me. Because all blessings are about me also doing what God described. You got to work for it. Somebody said, work for it. What, what do you mean, work for it? Um, you get ready to mess up, Pastor. You're, you're going into the law, you're taking us into a place of. 
square. You told me I got to work. We're under grace now. We're not under the law. Mm, I beg to differ with you. What God says in the scripture, if you go to Philippians chapter 2, verse 12 and 13, Paul was speaking to the Philippian church and he told them, yes, Jesus is Lord. Yes, Jesus paid it all. Yes, you are now saved. And you don't have all that there. He said, but look, as you have, go to verse 12, as you have obeyed me in my presence, and also now, even more so while I'm absent, here's what Paul told him. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Paul, you, you must have bumped your head. What do you mean work out? Because the word's not talking about your salvation as far as being saved. No, Jesus paid it all. But what it's saying is on this journey, you have a salvation walk. You have a journey. And in that journey, you ought to work out your own salvation with fear. You know what fear I have? With fear and trembling. The fear that I have is I'm going to miss something God has for me. That's my fear. I don't know about you. You're running around, and I hear about all these miracles, and I want everything God has for me. I want it. And now I'm telling you, you heard it here, you have to get it intentionally. If you see somebody blessed, you better believe they just didn't bump into that blessing. Got some kind of way, they got into the Word of God, and they worked it. Fear. I fear I'm going to miss what God has for me. Tremble. I tremble that there's a God I may disappoint. I'm not worried about the devil. I'm not worried about the enemy. I'm not worried about that. My fear and tremble is that I don't honor the God who's honored me. Come on, look what God has placed in you. The God that honors me, that's what I fear. Because the word of God tells us God is intentional and we as disciples must live intentionally. Let me quickly shoot to the text so I can get out of here, but I need to share this with you. When, you, when you're an intentional Christian, several blessings come into your life. When you're an intentional Christian, when you don't just live hoping and, and stuff gets, you know, stuff gets come my way. But when you're intentional, you get up, you find a scripture that says, I need to be healed. And you work that scripture until your healing comes. Let me give you an example. When you're intentional, you get run over by blessings. Deuteronomy chapter 28 verse 1 says, Hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God to observe and do all that I command thee this day. And when you do that, the Lord shall set you on high above all nations, and all these blessings will run you over if you hearken diligently unto the voice of God. Listen to the power in that scripture. When you hearken, intention, diligently, intention to the word of God. He said that's the difference between a successful Christian and a Christian who don't make it. You wonder why I make it and look like you should be doing better than me? It's because I'm intentional in my worship and in my pursuit of God's Word. And now I turn around and blessings are running me over because I called them to me. When you're an intentional Christian, when you pray with intentionality, you get a power that you never knew. One of my favorite scriptures is Jeremiah 33 and 3. Listen to the text. It says, Call on me! And I will answer you and show you great and mighty things that you know nothing about. Here's what I believe. I believe those of us, first, you see the intentionality, call on me and I will answer. God said, call on me and I will answer because many Christians have missed their blessings because you've been praying wrong. Here's how you pray. Prayer is twofold. Listen to what God says. Call on me. And I will answer. Prayer is calling, petition, and listening. you got to get somewhere, sit down, listen to God, because he wants to give you instructions on how to get it. And if you look, it says once you call on him and listen, all I'm saying, when is the last time you stop after you prayed and on purpose just found a place to just sit down and hear the voice of God? I believe there's a whole lot of saints who have missed God's voice have missed God's blessing because you won't sit down and listen to what I believe God is, because the Bible says he will show you great and mighty things. When you are an intentional Christian, last thing, you can run the devil away. 
James 4 and 6. I, I like this, James 4 and 7. It says, um, uh, when you seek God, resist the devil. Submit yourself to the Lord. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. James 4 and 7. Submit yourself to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Some of y'all walking around talking about, get thee behind me, Satan. The devil said, hold up. First of all, you got to submit your life to God before you can talk to me. But then, after you do that, you got to read this. Some of you sit there and say, you think resisting is fair. Like, I'm sitting up here, I'm resisting, and I must be failing. Something's going wrong. No, you got to start rejoicing because when you sit and resist, that means that I am prepared to sit and resist. Devil, that's how you get behind me because I'm ready to take you on, and I'm not moving until the Lord says move. In this book of James, it is packed of principles from chapter 1 to chapter 4 that tell us how to be intentional Christians. It's a book that sprinkles into us the results. James, you know, I gave you background last week, so I'm not going to give you all the background. Go back to the last, last week's message. Because, you know, James was the half-brother of Jesus Christ. Never walked with Jesus while he was, you know, alive. But then when he got saved like us, he was on fire. And in this first chapter, which we're covering, I gave you three points. Come on, write them down. I, I told you there were three points. Last week, I did one. And I shared with you, don't just talk about it, be about it. Be intentional. The first thing I told you, if you're going to have a state of being where, I, I like that, a state of being. Thank you, Holy Spirit. A state of being. Quit trying to be something you're not and actually become that which you are. It, to be an intentional Christian is a state of being. This is who I am. It's not something I'm trying to be. This is who I really am. I, I really am a praiser. I really do love God. I'm not putting on. I can't make it without God. It's intentional. So watch this. The first thing I told you is intentional believers become comfortable. You have to be comfortable in the war. Be comfortable in the war. You can't cry and whine and feel like you're falling apart with every battle. You have to secondly be humble in your heart. Be humble in your heart. Be comfortable with the war. Be humble in your heart. And be a doer of the word, not a hearer. Just in case you're writing it down, I'll say it again. You have to learn to be comfortable in the war. You have to be uh, humble in your heart and be a doer of the word. So last week, we talked about that first point of being comfortable in the war. And we looked at the first chapter, which says, James, uh, who was a servant of God, Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes that are scattered throughout Pontus, Cappadocia, and Greece. All right, so watch this. James' message was not like Paul's. Paul was writing to a specific group. James wrote to everybody. He said, my message is to cover anybody who's being persecuted. Anybody who has to go through trials. Anybody suffering. He said, I want you to learn how to count it all joy. So the first thing he said is, you got to learn how to get comfortable in the war. Realize it's a battle. Come on. Pick your shoulders up. Look at me. And no, you haven't lost yet, have you? So why are you sitting there like you can't? You've been struck down. You've been smacked down. And God never let you fail. Where are the people that know God picked me up, got me from where I was? Where are the people that have been through sickness, been through poverty, been through trials, and you still got a praise in your heart? Where are the folks that are saying, I can hold on because it's a war? Don't get shocked every time something happens. I'm not shocked. I'm delivered. I'm depending on God to come through. You can't get out of the battle was the first thing we said. You know what? I look back, and now there's people out there. You want to explain a battle away. Lord, deliver me. God said, you can't get out of the battle. I'm sorry. It's part of who you are. I look back on our old folk. I grew up in an old Baptist church. When old folk used to get focused, they didn't focus on what they were going through. They focused on the God who were helping them get through what they were going through. We focus on what's wrong. What, what you focus on? I got cancer. What you focusing on? I lost my job. What you focusing on? My kids aren't right. We focus on everything but God. They focus on the battle. You don't believe me? Come on. You can identify with this. How many of you grew up in one of them good old sanctified churches where when they sang songs, sometimes you didn't know they were going to sing the same words every Sunday? 
or they will pick up and pick up the singer verse and all of us will join in the verses or they sing a common meter and moan through it. But they used to sing songs that helped them in the war. How, how many of y'all, they sang stuff like, I'm a soldier in the army of the Lord. I'm a soldier in the army. And they didn't, they didn't stop there. You could tell they were all in, all in, because here's what they said. They said, if I die, let me die. Let me die. They said, yes, this battle is serious. And they would continue. And they think stuff like, uh, I'm on the battlefield for my Lord. Yes, I'm on the battlefield for my Lord. Here it is again. I promised him that I would serve him till I die. Some of us don't realize this battle started in heaven between God and Satan. It's a, it's a contentious life, but it's a victorious life because Jesus paid the price. I need somebody watching me to lift your hands in the air and just say, I'm in the battle, but I already got the victory. And I'm on this battlefield, but I'm trusting God. It's a battle. You can't get away because when things got real tight, look like the devil was winning. They would sing that old song. I got to keep moving. They would sing that old song. Uh, we have come this by faith, leaning on the Lord. They were in a battle. And then we told you, not only can you not, not, you know, can't get out of the battle, sometimes you got to be on offense and not defense. Do you know a lot of us live defensive Christian life where we don't even pray until the enemy done took half our stuff? We don't even pray until the enemy has taken everything we need. We don't realize that we got to get on the offense. And I showed you last time, sometimes you got to declare war on the devil. And not only is it a time when you got to strike out and say, I declare war on the enemy. Once you learn to get comfortable, you start saying, uh, count it all joy when you fall into darkest temptation, knowing the trying of your faith work patience. So you understand. So that first point, you got to go back and grab the rest of that. Let's go to the second point so we can finish the message. Not only must you be comfortable in the war. You must be humble in your heart. This took us to verse 9. So we just talked about a double-minded man. We ended that part with tried faith, that a faith that is not tried is not worth anything anyway. But verse 9 said, Let the brother of low degree rejoice in that he is exalted in the rich that he is made low. So God said, The lynch pin to blessings. Of course, we have faith and we have the power of love. But can I tell you one of the best ways to get blessed and get into the presence of God is through your humility. Having the proper view of who you are. When you have the proper view of who you are, matter of fact, humility is described as a person who has a modest or realistic view of who they are. You don't prop yourself up. You aren't prideful. You have to realize that when you're not, matter of fact, James just said it. He said, if you're low, Thank God that he took your lowness, your, your messed up life, and he raised you higher. How many of us know without God, I wouldn't be where I am? But also, if you're rich, thank God that you got enough Holy Ghost sense to know I can't flaunt my riches because they really can't save me. I got to go down lower. The Bible says humility is what we seek from God. If we were to go to First Peter and look at verse uh, 5 and 6, it says, Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, and he will exalt you in due season. Humble yourselves. Uh, James chapter 4, verse 6 says, uh, He giveth grace. He resisteth the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Got enough sense to humble yourself. Not only does it tell us, it tells us in Matthew 23, verse 11 and 12, Jesus was talking about the power of humility. In verse 11, he said, um, those of you who will be the greatest will be the servant of all. Servants are great, not braggarts. Servants are great, not folk who put other people down. Those who are humble are the ones that get the blessing. How do I know? You've got to learn to be humble. You've got to learn. Look, Michelle Obama said it great in the 2016 Democratic Convention. You remember that? Michelle Obama was speaking on behalf of Hillary Clinton. As he began to speak on behalf of Hillary Clinton, we found out that her now catchphrase that went viral that year came out. When, Hillary, when Michelle Obama came up and she said, when they go low, we go high. 
I love it. When they go low, he said, don't get down low with them. Many Christians have lost their blessing because you go low with them instead of remaining high. What am I talking about? She was on the Oprah Winfrey show, and she described what she meant by go high when they go low. She said, anybody can go low. Anybody can think there's something. Anybody can talk about somebody else. Anybody can be nasty. Anybody can put folk down. She said, but it's only a temporary solution. Wow. Being prideful will never get you to the blessing. You got to learn how to be humble, and that's where the real power comes from. There's too many things. You know why? You know why I stay humble, and why you should stay humble. What James is really saying, he said, "Remember that wherever you are, God's to get the glory." God to get the reason I don't try to flaunt it because I know I couldn't do it without him. How many of you know that God to get the glory? Whatever I am, whatever I have, whatever I have accomplished, whatever I got, whatever sense is in my mind, whatever peace I get, I know where it came from. You know how I know where it came from? Because I was out there doing everything I was big enough to do and still couldn't find peace, couldn't find any kind of assurance, couldn't find any security, couldn't find my way out. But when the Lord came and anointed me, with the Holy Ghost, where are the people that they can't even recognize you? Because God lift you up to a place that now you got confidence. Now you know it was God. Now you know who it is you worship. The reason you're humble, what to motivate you is, think about what your life was like without God and where you would be without God. Humble people. See, saints who don't humble can't come back from failure. Can I tell you this? A lot of times, what you count as failure is not really failure. You just, did, you know, you asked God for something. How can I put this? But you gave him an ultimatum. You know how we are. We got that one thing. I, I, I've had saints come to see me and say, all I asked God for was that one thing. He didn't give me that one thing. No, I don't have time to go there. But, you know, he gave you a whole lot of stuff. You just are mad because you didn't get the one thing, which means he didn't do it your way or do it in your time. But those of us who realize God has better timing, hallelujah, what it means is when I stick around for what God is doing, it's better than what I want it done anyhow. And I get a witness. It's better than what I wanted done when I stick around and watch what God does. God creates a masterpiece out of our life because he realized what he wanted to create in us. What am I saying? Um, Vanetta uh, Flowers. It, it, it's, it's, it's something, you know her, she was an African-American sprinter that went to University of Alabama in Birmingham. She trained for four years. She was a sprinter and a long jumper. She trained for four years to go to the 2000 Olympics. Like all of us, you know how hard those Olympics, you know, four years, that's dedication. She trained for four years. She stayed up late and, and she got up early. And all you got to think of all the running, all the training, all the dieting. And yet in two minutes, she failed to qualify. She lost four years in two minutes. She was devastated. She was desperate. It was the 2000 Olympics in Sydney, Australia. She knew she was going and she didn't make it. And yet, Vanetta Flowers got a gold medal during that 2000 Olympic season. So we're talking about Pastor. You just said she didn't make it. But yes, she still got a medal in that 2000 season. How did she do it? I'm glad you asked. Here's how she did. Vandetta Magritte, v v Vandetta Flowers wasn't like us. Vandetta Flowers wasn't like us. Vandetta Flowers was the kind that she had failed, but she was humble enough to not lay in her despair and lay in her desperation and lay there depressed. Someone came along and said, have you ever thought about bobsledding? She could have said, I'm a sprinter. I don't want to do that. But no, she actually started training for bobsledding, a sport she never saw, let alone had ever thought about doing. But she was humble enough to keep pursuing her life with intentionality. She knew she wanted to be an Olympic gold medal. And do you know what happened? Yeah, I guess you figured it out. In 2002, Vandetta McGee, I'm thinking about the actress, y'all pray for me. Vandetta Flowers, in 2002, she actually won a gold medal as the first African-American woman to win a gold medal in bobsledding. What about if she would have quit and given up? Mm, I'm talking to somebody. You're about to give up. 
and God hasn't finished writing your story. You're about to give up and you don't know the great heights God is getting ready to take you to. You're about to give up and he's about to make something beautiful out of your life if you humble yourself and go in his direction. You want to know the power of humility? Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 to 8. Read it. It is the scripture that talks about our Savior coming down. It, 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 it explains to us that Jesus, who was the third person of the Godhead, Jesus Christ, who was equal with the Father and the Holy Spirit, the verse said, let this mind be in you, verse 5, that was in Christ Jesus, who was equal with God, but thought it not be robbery to humble himself and become a servant and even die on the cross. He humbled himself. Those verses from 5 to 8 is called the great kenosis. The word kenosis is the Greek word that means empty. I'm helping somebody. If you're going to get God's power in you, you got to empty your foolishness out of you. you got to empty out the doubt, empty out the fear, empty out. But you can't empty it out without putting something back in. That's why you get intentional filling back that void with the word of God. And we found out that the Bible says he humbled himself even unto death. But if you go to verse 9, 10, 11, the reward for his humility was, and he's been given a name above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee must bow. Things in heaven, things in earth, things under the earth. Three planes has to bow down to the name of Jesus. There's nothing as mighty. Every knee must bow. Every tongue must confess that Jesus is Lord. Did you get that? So maybe you didn't get the one thing, but honey, hang in there with some intentionality. Find you one of those scriptures, full of the word of God. Walk that scripture out until you change your life. He said you must Humble yourself. And the last thing about humble people is right there in the verse when it says, uh, when you're tempted, don't say you're tempted of God. Humility, you know the verse is, and I got to move. Humility doesn't blame other people for the stuff we get caught in. Hmm. You never will rise to a level of power if you continue to blame folk, even if they did it to you. Blaming them is not going to help you. Rise up and know you have a greater help. It says when you're drawn away, you're drawn away of your own lust. When lust comes forth, it brings forth sin. Sin brings forth death. All it's saying is if you get caught in the cycle of blaming, let no man say when he's tempted, he's tempted of God. I'm just using that to show you that humble people admit what they're wrestling with. They give it to God and God blesses them. We want to blame God. You gotta be humble in your heart. You're this close to getting a blessing if you would just humble yourself. The prodigal son would have still been in the pig pen, in the mud, if he hadn't humbled himself. That's close. Not only must you be humble, the last thing is verse twenty one, verse twenty two says, and be a doer of the word. You need to learn to be a doer. This sermon today. As I close, is about action. You can lay down and cry. You can run around. You can listen to me and turn me off. Or you can say, here is a list of the stuff I need deliverance from. Here is what I, where I want my life to go. You can get into this anointed word. Find out what God says and change your life. Somebody say with me, change your life. People who Talk, don't make it. You just can't talk. You, you just can't be a hearer. You just can't walk around with a bunch of Bible knowledge and look like you're a scholar and go to church and live a miserable life. You got to be a doer of the word. Do the word and watch what God says. I always tell folks when you listen to Joshua marching around the walls of Jericho, do you realize what faith they must have had, what intentionality they must have had when Joshua came back to that camp and told them, look, guys, uh, they got a big wall, Jericho is thick, and they got molten lava, and they got spears, and they got bow and arrows. We're going to leave all our weapons home, and all we're going to do is march around the walls because God said so. And they did it. They did it. And the walls fell. As I close, you got to do it. 
It's action. Don't just keep listening to sermons, flipping through the screen, flipping from all YouTube, go to Facebook. You got all kind of word in you, but you haven't done none. Do it. If you want healing, do what the word says to get healing. You want a better life, do what the word says to get a better life. Listen to me. The people who are in the Bible were not perfect people that God gave us examples of, but they were the ones who decided to do it. If you go to John chapter 5, you see a man who was born blind at the pool of Bethesda. And you remember he had been there all those years. Uh, I, I'm not, not going to go into my hoop. I just want y'all to know that the anointing has just hit me here. That when Jesus walked up and saw this man, even though he had been there, something happened when Jesus said, do you want to be made whole? And the Bible said Jesus gave him an instruction. Take up your bed and walk. The next verse said he was made whole because he took up his bed and walked. He was made whole not because he stayed at the pool, but because he got up and did something. The man born blind in John chapter 9, it was, the disciples said, why was this man born blind? He said, for the glory of God. The glory was this, God loves to take folk like you and me, turn our life around, and so he can show us off as we walk that path of the word. And the Bible says he told the man, he made spittle, put it on his eyes. See, we, we look at the miracle, but we don't look at the intentionality. We don't look at what they had to do. And it says, he looked at the man and said, go wash. And the man went and washed and came back seeing. Do something. As I close today, I want to challenge you to do something. Don't just continue to get all this scripture. Don't let the pandemic get in you. Grab that word. Be a doer of the word. All I'm saying is get excited. Get joyful. Get elated. Get overjoyed about what God is going to do. Because you now have a word that can deliver you. Be a doer. Watch the victory. Pray with me. Father God, I thank you for all you've done today. And there's somebody here who's been in a situation that they can get out of if they would just remember. Remember, I'm going to do something. Somebody not saved today. Pray with me. Say these words. Say, Lord God, I need your help. I tried it on my own. I believe you died for my sins. I know you rose again with all power. I believe it. I confess it. And I am Say this, Pastor Duncan. Saying, "God bless you. Enjoy the rest of your day. Remember, don't just talk about it. Be about it. Blessings are intention." To him and leave it there. I was down, but with a no way up, and I needed some help. Everybody breathing, but not living, just existing. Well. And I needed some help Somebody told me that Jesus Will set you free I tried it for myself And now I know What he did